Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Five Tips for Identifying Perfect Fit Candidates, presented by iSIMS and eSkill. So some quick need to knows before we get started. Um, we will be presenting, uh, I'm sorry, we'll be recording today's presentation and sending out copies of the recording to all attendees. Um, your phones will be muted during the presentation, so uh, if any of you have any questions, um, please use your GoToWebinar uh, controller to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll be uh, saving about 15 minutes to go through all the submitted questions, um, so we will uh, get through them at the end. And then uh, also, at the end of the webinar, um, there will be a survey, so please take a moment to complete it. So my name is Danny Suzo. I am a Partner Relationship Specialist here at iSIMS, uh, and I will be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. Today's speakers, um, from eSkill, we have Kelly Painter, VP of Sales. Kelly has over 12 years experience working in talent management. Uh, she has a broad background in scoping talent solutions, implementation planning, delivery of service, and strategic planning on behalf of her clients. Uh, as a, task, uh, as a, task, a talent management solution provider, she has delivered real business results to her customers while leading and developing a high-performing team of sales and service professionals. And on the iSIM side, we have Brandon Feiner. Uh, Brandon has been with iSIMS for just about four years in various roles, um, almost always working closely with the integration team. Uh, the past year, Brandon has been in the role of business systems analyst, uh, and in that role, Brandon works uh, alongside project management and development um, and product documentation teams to facilitate the design, development, and release of iSIMS platform features. Um, to give you an overview of the iSIMS and eSkill relationship, uh, our two companies have had a strategic partnership in place for, for just about a year now. Um, our partnership and integration allows recruiters to easily create configurable tests from the extensive library available uh, in the eSkill Test Center um, and send those test results to candidates um, with the results fed directly into the iSIMS platform, helping recruiters identify top candidates and make the best hiring decisions. Um, Kelly, do you, have, do you have anything to add here? No, just that um, we, we really try to focus on making sure that we provide um, a, an easy button, if you will. Um, so when our joint customers come to us, um, we really like to partner with them and provide the best experience. And we feel like iSEMS is one of the best partners out there from applicant tracking standpoint um, in that, that they come to the table with us and help us really understand what the client's looking for and make it um, possible as quickly as possible. Um, and so we, we feel like our, our integration with iSEMS is really a good partnership for us, um, but also for our customers. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, as far as today's agenda, um, we're going to discuss the new recruitment landscape uh, and new processes for finding top talent. Uh, and then we're going to jump right into the five tips for identifying perfect candidates. Um, Brandon's going to discuss why talent acquisition deserves its own suite. And then we're going to finish up with some comfort company overviews and some questions. Uh, that being said, uh, we'll jump right into the, uh, the presentation here. All right. Thanks, Danny, for the intro. Hi everyone, my name is Brandon, uh, and I've really been looking forward to this webinar this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to start out these webinars with the point presented here on the first slide. It's potentially an obvious topic, but the fact is the recruitment landscape has changed. It's changed over the last several years, and it's still changing every day. Ultimately, CEOs are staying up at night trying to find top talent. Even our own CEO, Colin Day, outside of the bottom line, is always asking, when we're, when we're going to get that new top developer, that top account manager, that top sales guy. An interesting study that we conducted shows that almost 80% of companies find a shortage of critical skills available in their candidate pools. This shows that recruiters are having a really tough time finding the skills that are required to fill the roles of their organization. This is backed up at the CEO level as well, with nearly a third of chief executives also finding acquiring top talent to be one of the largest hurdles in achieving strategic goals, especially in certain industries like healthcare technology, where you see this more. Another pretty interesting fact based off our own research done by our Higher Expectations Institute is a graph below showing the average number of candidates has, has fallen across the board. This makes it more important than ever to get in that top talent, get them in the pipeline, and using the screening tools available, some of which we'll talk about during this webinar, to ensure that you're getting the best possible people to fill positions in, at your organization more efficiently and effectively. Some of the new processes that we have identified to acquire top talent, you'll find focus a lot around technology. I, I personally am a technologist. I, yeah, I think about it very often. I can see the way it's impacting the industry um, and at almost every step of the hiring process nowadays. 
A lot of the old processes, quite frankly, just don't work, and they're not as effective as they used to be, whether it be screening candidates or even how candidates apply to jobs, et cetera. Our research indicates that finding talent is shifting more towards marketing strategies. We find recruiters are pitching to candidates in order to ensure that we are getting that to ensure we're getting in all that top talent. To handle all these shifts, our research indicates U.S. companies spend $22 billion in technology and services for talent acquisition. That's an enormous number. It shows the importance of getting in that top talent from the outset, but also the investment companies are willing to make to find it. We also found, to little surprise, that 76% of recruiters surveyed said their recruiting techniques have changed over the last three years, with half of, half of these organizations interested in replacing their existing technologies for recruitment. For example, having a mobile optimized career site, you know, without the mobile optimization on your career site, you can lose upwards of 40% of, 40 40 of your candidates. These are interesting numbers that validate the need for adjusting to shifting technologies impacting our industries in this day and age. Even with the technology in place, there are still some challenges with the implementation of processes to get that perfect candidate quickly. It now takes 62% longer, equates to about five additional weeks, to fill the average vacancy. This is that golden metric of time to fill. This is a staggering number you can guarantee a director, VP, or any higher up in your company will not be too thrilled to know about. You want to make sure that you have a process to not only get the candidates in, but to move them through the pipeline to identify your best talent and get them all the way through to an offer as quickly as possible. The study found that 77% of hiring managers state that, recruiters can, that, that the recruiter's candidate screening is inadequate. And this, this metric probably is more geared towards the relationship between the recruiter and the, the hiring manager rather, is, rather than it is towards the skills of the recruiter themselves. There's always that friction with hiring managers thinking that the recruiter just doesn't know the skills that they're looking for or exactly what they're looking for in a candidate in general. It's important here to treat the hiring manager as a business partner and keep them involved at every step of the way. So you don't get that hiring manager saying that Joe recruiter screening was inadequate. And finally, 80% of hiring managers and 84% of recruiters agree that, the hiring, that hiring the right people has a direct impact on the company's ability to achieve its, its strategic goals. This stat is the reason why I said CEOs are kept up at night, and frankly, it probably should be 100%. They know the importance of getting the right people out of the gate, in, into the companies right out of the gate, uh, in order to hit those organizational goals and stay on top of the industry. Thanks, Brandon, for that. Um, so now we're going to jump into the, uh, the five tips here, um, and we'll let, uh, we'll let Brandon kick it off. Sure, yeah, I just want to quickly speak this slide a little bit because, uh, you know, our items product does have some uh, screen questions features, um, but definitely I'm going to uh, jump to uh, kick it off to Kelly uh, for a second uh, opinion on these. You know, it is important, screening questions, I'm sure everyone's aware of, it's important to get those done right up front. Uh, it's getting those qualifications and requirements from the outset so so that if you're, if you're using the technologies like screening questions or ranked screening questions, the back end itself can help filter out the cream of the crop uh, and, and, and help identify those top candidates right out of the gate or at least weed out some of the, the ones that aren't quite qualified. Um, the ranking uh, I want to speak to comes into play so you, you can have your basic screening questions like, uh, um, you know, are you a U.S. citizen? Are you know, able to, to work in the U.S.? Uh, which is very important to identify, but also you know, if you have more specific, uh, job-specific questions that you want to be able to rank uh, the responses differently, um, you would be able to do that to, to get a little bit more precise with your automated, automated uh, candidate screening. Um, again, this, all of this happening at the outset of the candidate application in order to do that initial screening. Um, and then Kelly, you, can, you want to jump in on the, the next steps there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you, Brandon. Um, so what, what it, my point with this um, first tip is every company is unique and every position has specific requirements. There are basic requirements that um, would allow someone to move through the process and selection, but also um, identify them as a particularly high value um, candidate. Uh, for instance, you know, Brandon mentioned some basic questions like, are you a U.S. citizen or you know, are you 18, depending on what the requirements of the job are. But for some companies who have, um, you know, data, they've been able to identify that people that have certain kinds of experience or have worked for a particular competitor 
um, often can be a higher value um, a candidate. So to help identify those people early in the process, you want to identify the questions that are specific and unique to your company. Yeah, there are, are the basic questions, but there are some things, you know, that data can provide to you that you can really filter through the um, sea of candidates for some positions and, and really with that ranking um, be able to move those candidates to the top of the list really initially and upfront in the screening process. Um, that's why we want to make sure uh, we always recommend whenever we're talking to customers is do we understand the position and we understand what a successful individual in that position looks like. And that helps us create a better selection process and it all starts with the screening questions up front. So um, they, the kind of moral to this tip is make sure that you understand what a successful candidate looks like so you can ask the most appropriate screening questions up front. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lights, camera, action. On to the, the video uh, uh, technology. So video has been something that, that's been disruptive to talent acquisition, but, but in the best way. A few years ago, ISIMS introduced a video product, and many people were initially apprehensive to use it at first, wanting to make make sure you know it's compliant, um, make sure that they can fit it into the recruiting processes. You fast forward today and that taboo has almost completely disappeared um, from what we've seen. Uh, organizations are now asking how they can best use video directly in their screening processes, leveraging the technology as a tool to help find the best talent, reducing that time to fill. As you can see, as a result of video screening, recruiters report an 80% decrease in time required for effective screening and a 57% decrease in time to fill. You know, whether it's a video cover letter or just a, a Skype conversation, a video helps you dive deeper than the resume. It's certainly not for everyone. You know, if you have a, a developer that may not be as into a video cover letter as you would um, a sales or marketing professional, for example. But we ourselves have seen some really clever video resumes and cover letters. The time efficiencies. Uh, you know, are invaluable when it comes to identifying these soft skills like creativity, communication, and 77% of HR professionals find it to be just as important as teachable skills, the soft skills. Okay, so thank you. Um, so what it, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today is kind of put it into perspective is um, the cost of a bad hiring decision. So it's estimated that 30% of the employee's first year potential earnings is, is a cost that everyone can um, can agree upon because it's a hard number and you can um, attribute that cost to someone being hired, you know, taking a few months to evaluate, you know, whether they're appropriate for the organization, for the particular role, um, for the training programs, um, and, a, and a cultural fit within the organization. So this is why screening um, is very important initially to understand what the, the individual brings to the table. But when you think about that, um, that's, that's a hard cost because we know it, it takes an average of three to six months to evaluate an individual without any kind of screening process in place. And so that's how they attribute that 30%. But if you think in terms of, let's just say that by, bad hire is a salesperson, and that salesperson has um, had um, some contact with a lead pool. And that may be a lead pool that your company may never get back. Or it might be a customer service person who um, was doing poorly in the position, and by the time that you were able to exit them from the organization, they've made an impact on your customer base, um, whether, you know, whether they have, you know, terminated some customers' um, association with your organization, or um, if they have caused some disruption within the customer service base. And so those are the things that maybe are not captured in that 30%. So the real cost of hiring a bad person uh, just makes it more important and, um, you know, it, it can be detrimental to the organization across the board depending on the visibility of that individual. And that's why we, we believe that screening and the selection process is very critical um, for organizations in, in this day and age. Uh, Kelly, you want to talk about uh, asking about specific experiences? Okay, so when we start talking about specific experiences, um, so one of the things that has, has long been um, kind of a recruiter's mantra is that you know, we were taught that if someone has been able to show a um, or exhibit some experience that would be relative to a particular job, then we want to know about that. And so if we can get some sort of insight beyond just the information in the resume, but some insight into understanding, you know, how well they solve a problem or um, how have they handled conflict in the workplace in the past, 
Um, how, have they had an issue with a supervisor in the past? And how do we glean that information? So one of the ways that we do is, you know, we'll ask open-ended questions um, of our individual candidates. And, of course, we're asking the same question of each candidate that comes through at a certain point, but that helps us give um, some understanding of how that person operates given a particular situation. So um, at East Hill, we use situational judgment questions to be able to achieve that. And that's um, really important in understanding how potentially they will interact um, on, on the job. Okay? So um, in, in evaluating those open-ended questions, it is, it is uh, trying to create this picture of how this person has worked in the past. And um, one of the things that I really try to focus on is when have they been successful in the past and what was the environment they were in? All right, I'll give you an example. So if you hire one of your competitor salespeople, because they were an amazing salesperson at this other organization, and um, you, you somehow entice them to come over, and you recruit them, and you put them in a sales position. Um, one of the things they always try to understand is what, is, what was the environment like in the sales organization? Because not all organizations, they may be selling the same thing, but they may be structured differently. So um, I ask questions that are really um, related to um, the resources that they had available to them. What were the scope of what their responsibilities were? If you're in a, in a larger organization, a salesperson may only have to make their calls and close their deals. Um, they may have to go out and see customers or they may not. But if I bring them into a smaller organization where they have to do everything, they don't have an analyst, they don't have a sales support person, and that person may not be used to that kind of environment, may not be as successful. So that's why we try to look at what has been in your experience in the past and tell me about the environment that you are working in. And that really gives you some insight on what you can expect from the individual going forward. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. I'm going to jump back in again um, to talk about employee referrals a little bit. So you hear everywhere nowadays that employee referrals aren't only the best sources of applicants, but also your best sources of hire. Um, that's what makes these programs so important. Referred hires jump into the organization, hit the ground running, and they're shown to stay around with the company a lot longer than hires source through other means. The best way to leverage an employee referral program, program is to just make sure your, empl your employees are aware that you have one. Um, information, sent, uh, information sessions to keep uh, employees informed, and uh, the emails, the reminders. Here at ISIMS, we have some compensation awards or even some PTO incentives. It, it helps push the employee referrals and we're constantly being reminded of these benefits to, to getting in who we, who we as employees already identify as potential top performers and good fits to the company. You can have the best employee referral program in the business, but if your employees aren't aware of it, it can't be leveraged properly. As you see by the numbers run by our HEI, our Higher Expectations Institute, 88% of employers rate employee referrals above all other sources of quality hires, with 66% of those employers also agreeing that referrals are a better overall fit with the company. It just backs up the argument that employee referrals work. As I spoke to before, the incentives are, are what drives your employees to participate in these programs, you know, whether it be ca bonus, cash bonuses or time off. Uh, but also recognition goes a long way. Company-wide updates shouting out the top referrer, excuse me, referrer can help make sure it's recognized, validating the effort by the employee to refer a friend or or someone they've previously worked with. Outside of internal means like an internet site or internal communications to rely on employee to refer candidates, there are also some technologies that lever leverage social media to make it even easier for, to refer candidates as an employee. ITEMS offers such technologies like linking to Facebook or Twitter profile where you can post jobs through your employees' accounts with, with the permission, of course, it's an opt-in scenario. Um, this takes the burden off of the employee themselves. And, and as an employee, it's always nice to um, get a bonus check or, or an additional PTO day just because somebody saw a job opening on your Facebook uh, page. The importance, the importance of employee referrals is something that has been identified within talent ac acquisition space, and it's being used by recruiters across the board with 92% of companies now using social media in their recruitment efforts. And the technologies built around it make it even easier to leverage. Kelly, you want to talk about the incorporating assessments? Sure, absolutely. So um, assessments are um, sometimes a scary thing to think about if you've never um, had an experience with using an assessment before. 
So there, there are two kinds of assessments. One is for soft skills, which are the behaviors, um, the interest of the individual, um, the passions of the individual. You know, you hear in a cultural fit, you hear a lot of different terminologies. And essentially it is a good, validated, reliable assessment, behavioral assessment, interests, soft skill assessments. Those are the assessments that help you understand who the person is and who they will be throughout um, their career. And it's not, it gives you in, more insight than the 30 minute interview that you gave them that they practice for, maybe rehearsed for, anticipating what your questions are and trying to be the person that needs to get this job. When in reality, they show up and a week into the job, you realize they have completely different behaviors and different work style than what you believed um, that you saw in the interview. So behavioral assessments can be a really valuable tool um, again, if it's a validated, reliable assessment tool. The second piece of um, skills or assessment testing is, um, is really focused on skill set. So I, I'm sure all of you have heard or have read on a resume that somebody has an expert skill level in a particular um, subject. And I, I love to use Excel because um, you know, it's one of my favorite programs to use. So if, if I'm looking at Excel and I may need to hire somebody that can work with me and I say, you know what, I really need somebody with advanced skills. So people will tend to tell me, oh, I have advanced skills in Excel. Um, and then, you know, when I go to ask them questions about specific um, ways that they can use it, they have no idea. So the skills testing will enable you to better understand um, what their level is against the other candidates. So basically, with a behavioral assessment for looking for job fit, looking for cultural fit, um, looking for you know work styles, um, you're creating this level playing field. So if I never met a group of candidates and I have assessment data on them, now I can compare them without any other influence and say, okay, this person, these top five candidates have the experience I'm looking for, we believe they're going to be a good fit for this role. They're well equipped to do that because they have the skills and the behaviors that they that can allow them to potentially be very successful. And they're, they're going to fit in. And so that's what you want to think about when you think about assessments is it's objective information. Before the, the subjective information starts to come into play after an interview where you've seen someone, but really level that playing field by looking at the data. Right? And then choose your top 10 or your top 5 or your top 15, whatever the case may be. And then you can start to say, okay, now what separates these people? Because they all have the basic skills or the basic behaviors that I'm looking for. And now I can proceed with the selection process. And so if you think in terms of, you know, maybe you have used assessments, maybe you haven't. But if you think about that, you have now leveled the playing field and you're evaluating candidates on, on the same plane. Right before all of the other things come into play. And so that's why I really love assessment data because it helps me understand the candidate before I even lay, lay eyes on them. And I, I get that objective information and I can say, okay, who do I really believe is the strongest candidate because I have this objective data to work with. Right? And that's why I'm, I'm a huge proponent of assessments. Okay, Brandon, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. I 100% agree with all of that. Uh, I'm going to take some time now to jump into um, talk a little bit about talent acquisition. And you know, here at iTunes, we feel strongly that talent acquisition is so important, it actually needs its own suite, or more accurately, it deserves its own suite. Our statistic before about it taking five additional weeks to fill the average vacancy, monetarily, that, that equates to roughly $11.25 million per 1,000 vacancies from lost productivity and additional recruiting work. To any business, it, it's a staggering number. If you have an automated applicant tracking system, if you have screening tools like assessments, if you have a good relationship with a hiring manager, we feel that these numbers can go down significantly. Another metric that goes a long way for automated processes is, is that recruiters report spending an average of five plus hours per week related to manual and or redundant data entry. Recruiter, recruiters are brilliant people. They have many different hats. You know, marketing, sales, all these different roles. Why would you want them spending time going through Outlook calendars to schedule appointments, using Excel spreadsheets to track candidates or hiring processes, things like this? Really, what we're saying here is that a strong TA system with, an aut with automated processes can help get back those important hours of a recruiter's day, eliminating that mundane work. You see an important you see an important statistic we brought up earlier 
about 50% of organizations being interested in replacing their existing recruitment technology. As, and we also said a few times about the CEOs being bothered with it as well, uh, with getting a top talent. And 93% uh, that find they need to change their strategy for attracting and retaining talent. The problem is 61% do not know where to start. We feel that ISIMS can provide this value as a talent acquisition specialist. We can help focus on sourcing, hiring, and onboarding these candidates. And we hope that the hub for your screening tools provided by the partners like eSkill um, so that you can have a one-stop shop that utilizes all the tools within the platform. And also those that may live outside the platform through you know, partner connectors or other integrated and in ingrained processes. All right, I just want to talk a little bit about ISIMS uh, we, as a company. Uh, we were founded in the year 2000. Uh, we've been funded internally and profitable for over 13 years. We're a pure SaaS uh, software as a service, which means you don't need to do any of the hosting. We handle the hosting, the maintenance, support, et cetera, all in the quote unquote cloud. Um, we're over 550 employees, which I believe is over 600 now. Um, I've been here since we, there were uh, about 100, 150, so it's been really amazing to see all that growth over the years. Uh, and we have over 3,200 contracted customers representing an even larger number of organizations. Right, some interesting stats when it comes to the volume that runs through our system. So we're up to over 170,000 resumes submitted per day, and that's going to over 215,000 jobs that are posted each month. Over 1.8 million positions filled per year, which is it's an enormous number. I think we have one client that does 140,000 hires per year on their own, um, and that's with 145 million candidates spanning all of our client platforms. Uh, again, we focus on sourcing candidates with our Connect product and features. We handle the candidates in the pipeline, leveraging our partners' tools through integrations and other processes, all the way through the hire, where we get these hires ready for their first day of work with our onboard product. The next slide here it just shines a little bit light, a little bit of light on the great tools that are offered through the connectors with our partners like eSkill. Um, tools to attract the first bucket there. Uh, you know, being able to attract the best candidates by posting your jobs to countless job boards. You know, through desktop or, or, or mobile optimized portals. Um, we also have tools for more proactive sourcing with the tools to find um, through job matching, uh, parsing of resumes to match their skills, as well as you know, resume database uh, integrations and connections. Uh, our tools to screen, where you'll be able to find those top applicants using great tools by partners like eSkill early on in the process, and actually utilizing some of that info for post hire as well, which Kelly's going to get into shortly. Um, then utilizing you know other screening tools along the way, video interviewing, reference checking, and finally you know a a background screen uh, towards the end of the closer to the offer process. You know all all utilizing connectors to bring um, the candidate through the hire as quickly as possible and these uh, processes as, as efficiently as possible possible. And then finally, upon the hire and after onboarding, we can hand that candidate off to the next system, also through a connector, which would be your ERP or HRIS system, getting them set up with payroll, et cetera. Um, I see our, our talent acquisition suite kind of as a system of record for the candidate. Uh, and then that handoff to the HR software, the HRIS, giving to them the, the system of record for the employee, which is created by the basis of information collected during our hiring process. All right, finally, you know, I'd like to speak to this slide. As I said a couple of times, we view ourselves as, as the hub in your talent acquisition needs. We provide that one platform. We can leverage all the different tools and services that you use in your day-to-day -day processes. Um, all, all, all along the way, from sourcing through that handoff to an HRA system for that employee record creation, we want to make it as simple as possible, providing a unified user experience, letting you benefit from the time and quality efficiencies. Now to pass off to Kelly to talk a bit about eSkill. Yeah, so thank you, Brandon. Um, so when you think about eSkill, um, there's a lot of testing providers out there. Um, they generally will provide a, a, a test um, content. Um, they, they, they quote unquote validate the content. Uh, we do that as a standard practice. But in reality, eSkill is a testing platform. So we've tried to take into account um, the need for standardized tests, but as I mentioned a couple of times during this presentation, is each company is unique, and the requirements that they have for specific positions within their organization may not be, um, 
an off-the-shelf description and we may need additional information. So we've put the customization piece of um, that process of, in the selection process into the hands of our customers. So we allow you to use our content, the over 50,000 questions that we've created on the testing platform um, that includes situational judgment questions and includes um, simulation tests for the Microsoft Office products as well as multitasking. Um, so we, we really invested in creating content that is accessible to our customers, but then giving them the tools um, within our platform to be able to customize any of those tests to meet the needs in their, of their selection process. And so I think that's why um, there are companies like Zappos and the State Department and GE and Stanford and ADECO who really rely on that capability to be able to create the new unique skills testing and the unique um, uh, questions that they need to gather information from those candidates um, and really try to make a, a really good hiring decision about those individuals based on the information they've gathered. Next slide. So uh, when we talk about skills testing um, as a pre-hire tool, um, we talked about uh, talked a little bit about you know why you would ask certain questions and you know why it's important to be able to appropriately screen those candidates. Um, so in the pre-hire, it seems very logical. Uh, we want to make sure that we're we're following the EEOC guidelines, Department of Labor guidelines and we're applying the same selection process across the board. Um, and uh, skills testing content allows you to level set and create that level playing field with objective information. But what we're finding with a lot of our customers is understanding where the skill gap is in their existing em employee base. So when you start to think about I, you know, training um, to enhance the skill set of your current employees, you can use skills testing to really identify that skill gap and then um, be able to more effectively use your training dollars going forward. Annie, I'll Perfect. hand it back to you. Thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, Kelly and Brandon, thank you. That was, uh, that was excellent. Um, then I can jump into some of the questions you, uh, you have all provided. Um, Kelly, I have one here that I think would be good for you. Um, so what type of information should I be looking to receive from candidates through assessment questions. Okay, I'll I'll take that one. So um you can you can get a lot of different information from um, assessment questions. You can evaluate again hard skills. So get you know how many words per minute can an individual type. Um, you can evaluate their knowledge base um, based on a particular subject. If you're looking to hire a C plus plus developer. Um, then you want to ask them about um, questions that are related to um, the knowledge around the particular software or um, a certain process within the software. Um, I, we have a lot of customers actually getting uh, into uh, our system and creating projects where they're having developers or they're having engineers or they're having financial um, analysts or um, accountants. They, they provide them with a, an actual project and ask them to go in and create the project and then submit their um, completed project as part of their skills testing evaluation. So there are a lot of different ways that you can approach that, um, the, the assessment questions. On the hard skills side, it's a little bit easier. On the behavioral side, that assessment has to be validated, it has to be a reliable, and it has to meet or exceed all of the guidelines that have been set through various um, regulatory um, programs so that's, it's, a, it's a little bit different animal than skills testing and creating a, a unique skills test. But behavioral assessments can really give insight into an individual um, and provide really good information with regard to job fit and cultural fit. Um, so there, um, and, and behavioral tests are psychometric tests. So there, there's a lot of um, research. There's a lot of data analysis. Um, there is a lot of... Um, uh, validation work that goes on is, is ongoing in behavioral testing. Um, and the same can be said about skills test, but skills test is a little bit different in that we're identifying that a particular skill is needed and we're creating a test that will reflect the level of skills that an individual has. So the, uh, the, the difference in assessment questions can vary based on what kind of information you're trying to get out. Great, Kelly, thank you. Um, Brandon, I have, I have one for you here. Uh, um, so how, is, how important is it for organizations to have company career portals? Can't companies just use a job, uh, job board to advertise open positions? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, company career, uh, career portals, uh, in my opinion, they're, they're extremely important. You know, uh, we have some numbers, I believe it's over 70%, over 75% of job seekers agree that the professionalism, the look, the feel of that, that uh, your company's career portal um, is a pretty important factor in deciding whether to apply for that job or within that organization. I like to think of it as like the, the old adage of, of first impressions are the most important. Uh, that is your first impression with that candidate being able to uh, jump in and, and see your company for the first time by applying to a job from your career portal. Um, with a, a career portal out, outside of the job boards, uh, there's also, in my experience, a lot better um, uh, connection with the platform itself, uh, whether it be getting data back or flexibility on, on you know, screening questions or, or the, the um, application process itself. Uh, so there are, the career portal, portals are definitely a, an incredibly important uh, part of sourcing candidates and, and just a great landing page and, and a first doorstep uh, to that to your company as a whole. Perfect. Thank you, Brandon. Um, Kelly, I have a question for you here. Um, this is the question is, uh, are you aware of any customer service skills testing for utility companies? If so, please elaborate. Well, we, we have um, a few utility companies as customers, and so we've just identified based on job descriptions what the requirements were, and we took um, the, our customer service um, simulations and our customer service um, content um, that's already been developed. Uh, we, we have in the simulations the ability to listen to a particular call, and then have um, a potential candidate respond to what, what they believe the next steps with that call would be. So we've done um, quite a bit of work around creating custom solutions for utility companies and we've been quite successful. Uh, one of the unique things about eSkill is that we do have the capability to, um, uh, in our content authoring tool, we, we put in the hands of the customer the ability to create custom questions with their own content. And so um, with most utility companies, they've some have been able to use um, our off-the-shelf content, um, meaning that they can customize particular subjects and topics that they want to ask their candidates. Um, and then we have a couple of others who have actually created their own custom content um, through our content authoring tool. So um, from our standpoint, we're able to accommodate any kind of um, testing that's required in a particular position, whether it's utilities or any other industry. Perfect. Thank you, Kelly. Welcome. Um, Brandon, I have I have a question here for you. Um, so, what are some success stories your uh, your customers have experienced using video in uh, in talent acquisition process? Okay, great. Um, there is one customer, uh, the Cumming Corporation, actually uh, had some pretty staggering uh, uh, successes with the the video interview uh, process. Uh, they actually experienced a pretty significant reduced time to fill for open positions. It went from a 37-day average down to, I believe, it was only 16 days using the video screening. Um, you know, that's around 21 extra days, three extra weeks there um, per hire that you can focus on other business needs. So, you know, that is just one of many examples, uh, the one that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, uh, to show the value of the video screening process. Thank you, Brandon. Um, Kelly, I have, a, I have a quick question for you here. Um, are eSkills tests available in languages other than English? Some of our content is translated into other languages, so it would just depend on the language requirement. Um, but from a standard Position. All of our content is in English. We do have some um, French Canadian. Um, we have some Spanish, um, and, and primarily that is because in in our system we allow our customers to do any kind of translation. I mean, most of our business is in North America, but we do operate um, with global companies. We do have partners in um, various parts of the world. So when there is a language requirement, we, we evaluate the request and we determine whether it's something that we could use across the board with our customers or if it is um, something specific to a specific customer. So we determine if we create that and make it available to everyone or we do custom work for that specific customer. Um, so 
primarily we do operate mostly in English, but we do have the capability to um, provide content in other languages. Excellent. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Uh, I mean, Brandon, I have one for you here. I'm um, going to talk quite a bit about um, employee referral programs, so there's a question related to that. Um, so just how successful are employee referral programs in finding top candidates? Thanks, Danny. Yeah, that, that's uh, another great question. Um, actually, I have numbers here, to uh, some additional numbers outside of what we went over in the slides um, from a Higher Expectations Institute. Um, we found that 56% of referred employees have been in their current position for over five years, and 70% have not changed positions since being hired. Um, that demonstrates you know, employers less of a need to backfill positions, uh, not nearly at the same rate as, as other ones. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it's a very successful, it's, it's a great way to, to bring in, it's kind of a pre-screen before candidates are even applied to these jobs. Uh, you already have a screening from somebody that is with the company, that understands the culture, the fit, sometimes the job position itself, the details there. So, uh, you know, you could jump into a role with somebody already knowing that you can succeed. I, I know I personally wouldn't refer anybody, you know, be on the hook for anybody, any of my friends that um, can't succeed in the, the role that, that I would refer them to. So. So it, it's kind of it's actually a stingent process too, to being able to uh, uh, feel trust in referring someone you know to a position that you're partly responsible for them being there in the job that they do. Uh, so I think it's an incredibly successful uh, way. Thank you, Brandon. Um, yeah, I know employer referrals are, are kind of close to my heart because I was uh, an employee referral action. <laughs> <laughs> Not by me. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kelly, I have another one here for you um, regarding eSkills tests. Uh, are eSkills tests validated? Yeah, our standard tests that we have created, um, and we have over 600 standardized tests within the eSkill testing platform, are representing over 480 different subjects. And so um, our standardized tests are validated. But I do want to make a point about validation is uh, when, we've, when we validate a specific topic or we validate a specific um, test, standardized test, one of the things that everyone must consider before you implement uh, you know, a skills test is identify if that test is really related to the position. I could have an accountant's test, a standardized accountant test, um, but there may be some things on that test that are not a requirement for that particular particular position in your particular organization. So I think there's a second level of validation. I'm using that word very loosely uh, in this term, is I might have a, valid, a validated standardized test, meaning that every question is not going to indicate whether you're part of a protective group. I'm not asking an inappropriate question. Um, the questions are really related to the skill sets. Then as I go and apply that, that test, in that particular position as a recruiter or HR professional, I still have to do a secondary validation. Are these the skills that are required um, for that particular position? And that's what's really important here to consider is any, any test or any part of the selection process that you put in place is um, you, you want to make sure that everything is relevant to what's required for success on the job. Um, you know, uh, uh, Brandon talked a little bit about hiring managers versus recruiters, you know. Everybody starts pointing the fingers when the process is broken down. But when you look at what a, a hiring manager is requesting, because he believes that he, here is the skill set that a person has to have to be successful, but in reality, maybe that not, may not be the case. And so I think the first step is making sure that the hiring manager and recruiter both agree on what's required for success, and then you look for a skills test to reflect what's required in that position. Great, Kelly. Thank you. And I actually have um, one more question uh, regarding e-skills testing. Uh, where do you get your questions for the subjects you have available? So we go through a process. We have a content um, development manager. Um, he goes through a process of identifying content related to a subject, does um, homework around, you know, what is the subject, what are the particulars about a subject, um, and he begins to create questions. Um, we go to subject matter experts in a particular subject. 
Uh, we want to make sure um, that, you know, if we're, if we're developing healthcare medical terminology questions, we want to make sure we, we um, address that with the subject matter expert that we're asking the right kind of questions in the right way at the right kind of reading level that we would expect from an individual. So we do go through a process of creating that content. And our content is updated constantly. Um, we get probably a release a month on um, a new subjects or new content added to an existing subject or, you know, Microsoft is changing their, um, their systems and software on a regular basis, so we have to keep up with that. So um, this process is just ongoing at eSkill at where, you know, that team probably never sleeps. Um, but it's just it's part of the process of making sure we have up-to-date content for our customers. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. And then I, I have one more question here, Brandon. I think you can take this one. Um, what specific industries are, are utilizing social media uh, the most in talent acquisition? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think it's in most of the industries that, that you would expect, you know, your computer services and engineering, also advertising, marketing, PR, you know, they're, they're definitely using social media the most for, for talent acquisition. Um, we do expect this to be, you know, way more widespread. Uh, it's increasing across all other industries. Um, I think we had uh, some statistics earlier on in, in the slides for it. Um, you know, it, it, uh, also additional technologies would be able to help drive this up. Uh, we have uh, some products with ISIMS, like I said, it's just, you know, it's as easy as signing yourself up for it as an employee, uh, for an employee referral thing and utilizing all of your employee social networks. Um, so beyond just a company Twitter account, a company Facebook account, you are increasing that exponentially by utilizing uh, the, your employees that have opted in to help you know find positions uh, at a company. So uh, just starting out uh, with those few as the most used, but also becoming more widespread industry, across all industries. Great, thank you, Brandon. Um, so that's going to uh, wrap up all the questions we have today. Um, thank you for all those who, uh, who submitted a question. And um, so that's going uh, to conclude the webinar for today. Uh, if anyone has any additional questions, please let us know offline. Um, Kelly, thank you very much for uh, jumping on the presentation today. And uh, a big thank you to the rest of the eSkill team. Uh, really appreciate all the work on this. Thank you. You're and, welcome. Uh, Great, thank you. And uh, and Brandon, you know, thanks for your help on the ISIM side. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so for all who attended, um, please keep your eye out for a, a follow-up email that will include today's recording. Uh, and again, feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Um, everyone, enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you very much for attending our webinar.